welcome to Only Baptist Church. I want to thank Pastor Tubbs for giving me the honor and privilege to preach tonight. If there's anyone in here or um, online who do, does not know who I am, my name is Kyle, and I am the youth and children's pastor here at OBC. I was thinking about our service tonight and the title, the title of being Good Friday, and how that might be strange to someone if I were to invite someone who has never been to church before, and I would invite them to, some, to our service called Good Friday. And that would be strange to them because they would ask me why we're having a service. What do you celebrate? You mean how we're celebrating? We're celebrating the day when an innocent man was beaten, humiliated, and died the worst death possible. And they would look to me and they would say, that sounds like a terrible Friday. But the fact is that Jesus himself looks back on this day and rejoices. If we had the ability to go back in time and, and say, Jesus, don't do this, he would say the same thing as he said to Peter when he said, get thee behind me, Satan. So we're going to look at why this was a good Friday indeed, and why there is absolutely something to celebrate on this night. There are two things I want to, we want to do tonight. First, we want to look at what happened on this day. What happened on the day that Jesus was crucified? We want to remember that, reflect on that. After we do that, second, we want to ask the question, what do we do then? After we remember what happened on this day, what are we to do with that? Because it is possible for us to reflect and remember this day and reflect on this day, and that still not impact us very much on a personal level. So what do we do after we remember? We're going to start by reading Mark 25, 21 through 39. That was Mark 15, 21 through 39. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a school. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his left and one on his right. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that he had died, saw that he had breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. So the first thing we want to look at is what happened on this day. Many things happened on this day, on earth and in the spiritual realm as well. There are seven specific things to look at. We're going to take an hour for each one of those. No, no, we're going to go through them pretty quick. There are seven specific things we want to look at. First, the sky went dark. Some say that the entirety of the earth's sky went dark. Some say it was just the specific region where Jesus was crucified. There are actually quite a bit of few um, important figures in history who say that it was worldwide. Um, there is just really no way for us to know for sure because the Bible is not that specific. We do see this as a supernatural event, as it is not possible for, not possible for the, an eclipse to happen during this time of the year. And the biggest thing for us to take away on this is that this shows um, the great significance of what happened on this day. Second, an earthquake happened. Matthew tells us that this earthquake happened to raise some of the saints who had fallen asleep who then appeared to many after Jesus resurrected on Sunday morning. This earthquake showed, um, again, the great significance of what happened on that day. Third, Jesus' mission was complete. Jesus was born for this day. 
Jesus was born for the purpose of being the sacrifice for sin. The Day of Atonement happened once a year, and all the sins of Israel were symbolically placed on the sacrificial lamb who was punished and killed in their place. When Jesus died, he became the last sacrifice for sin, the perfect, the final sacrifice for sin. Jesus said in the book of John, it is finished. His mission was complete. What Jesus came to do on earth, he was done with that. And he will finalize that on Sunday as he overcomes death itself. Number four, the curtain tore. Um, with this, the way to communicate with God changed forever. Up until this point, the Holy of Holies is where God spoke to the high priests. The curtain acted as a barrier, but on this day, that curtain tore. Y'all, when my son gets a toy from Target and he brings it home, I can barely get the plastic open to get the toy out. But this curtain in the temple was 60 feet high and four inches thick. This was no accident. This massive curtain tore completely from top to bottom. The way we communicate with God changed forever. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12 says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the great and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of his, uh, his creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And that's why Paul can say in Hebrews 4, 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. The way we communicate with God changed forever. So the sky went dark, an earthquake happened. Jesus' mission was complete. A curtain tore, the curtain, curtain tore. Number five, spiritual death was defeated. Colossians 2.13 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Spiritual death was defeated. So there's two kinds of death that we see. One is physical, one is spiritual. Physical death we understand well. Physical death is when we're done with this world. Spiritual death is different. Spiritual death is eternal separation from God. Our sin immediately and eternally makes us separated from God. But when Jesus died on the cross and the veil was torn, Jesus made it to where we can, be, we can now be alive in God. To know God, to walk with God, to have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. As soon as you come to trust in Jesus, your spiritual death is eliminated. You are no longer separated from God. Number six, Jesus disarmed the enemy. Colossians 2.15 says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus disarmed the enemy. There's something that the Romans would do whenever they were uh, to conquer another people. Um, of course, when they won, they didn't just want to win. They wanted to humiliate them in some way. And so they did that by marching them through the streets of Rome, often with no clothes on. And they would say, these are the people who said that they would destroy us. They thought they had a chance of beating us, but not for a second. And this is what Jesus did to demonic power. Jesus showed us how ineffective the enemy can be in the life of a believer. He showed us the authority a believer can have over the enemy. Jesus took the victory they thought they had won. They thought they were in control. They thought they had orchestrated Jesus dying on the cross. And when Jesus died, Satan and his angels yelled, Yes, we have won. Jesus took the victory they thought they had to strip them of their power and authority of his people. And that's why when we look at hard times and difficult situations in our life, we can look back on that day 2,000 plus years ago and know that if we believe or if we belong to Jesus, we already have victory. Jesus has already overcome the world. Sometimes we can be pretty anxious in times when we're being oppressed by the enemy. Isn't it helpful to know that we are going up against beings who have already been beaten? We're going up against someone who we already have victory over as long as we belong to Jesus. 
That does not mean that we won't have, that we won't be attacked or have difficult times, but it sure does mean we can thrive in difficult times. Thriving in hard times does not mean that they're necessarily easier, but it does mean that in the midst of sadness, we can still have joy. In the midst of suffering, we can still have peace. And in the midst of pain, we can still have hope. We can because we already have victory in Jesus. And it happened on this day on the cross, and it will be finalized on Sunday morning. The next time you feel that you may be in spiritual warfare, just remember that you're going up against someone who has already been humiliated and put to shame. The last one, number seven, a transaction happened. Colossians 2.14 says, By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with, with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. A transaction happened. On our behalf, a price was paid. A price paid for our sin. The reason we say there is nothing you can do about your sin is because there is nothing to do about your sin. Having salvation in Jesus is not about becoming a better person or a better version of who you are or trying to fix the worst parts of yourself or trying to clean yourself in any way. Our sin is not forgiven because we say sorry or because we feel bad about it. Our sin is forgiven because of Jesus' sacrifice and that we have believed in that first. Then, after that, change can happen in your life. The word here in Colossians, we'll go back to that. The word here in Colossians means a receipt. We would often use the word bill or uh, debt, that's which is used here in um, the ESV. So when you go out to eat somewhere, you receive a bill. I do not have a restaurant receipt. I do have one from Hobby Lobby, which my wife would be pleased. She would approve of that. So when we go out to eat somewhere, we receive a bill. And on it is listed everything we ordered. And if you did not know, you, you cannot leave the restaurant without paying your bill. Okay, Pastor? No, I'm just kidding. You cannot leave the restaurant. You cannot leave that place without that bill being paid for. And that's the same idea with our sin. There's a bill out there with my name on it. And there's a bill out there with your name on it. And on that bill is listed every sin we've ever committed. Every single sinful thought, every single sinful action is on that bill with our name on it. So imagine if you were to have your bill, you would hold it up, and if you were to drop it, it would just roll for miles and miles. And this bill is not just a record of our sin. It goes against us. As Colossians says right here, it goes against us. It condemns us. As we talked about before, it separates us from God. Instead of a, a restaurant bill with a couple meals on it, it's as if this bill were telling us that we owed trillions of dollars with no way to pay. But as we said before, this is Good Friday. Because if you trust in Jesus, your debt died on the cross with Jesus. We're going to talk about another word here. And the word is canceling, by canceling the record. This word canceling here is a dramatic word. It refers to erasing an entire book. And our debt is actually listed in a book. That book is referred to in Revelation. And in Matthew 12, 36, we read, Every man will give an account of every idle word they speak. But when you came to believe in Jesus, or if you have not yet, when you do, and I pray that you do, but when you come to believe in Jesus, it's as if Jesus comes to this book. He opens it up. He looks for the volume with your name on it, and he just starts erasing. Every single word, every single page, every single sin is as if it were never written down. The debt is paid. The debt is gone. Jesus has already completed the work. All you need to do is trust in that and believe that Jesus is God. And then you can start a brand new life in Jesus. So number seven, a transaction happened. 
So now that we have an understanding, we, we've, we, we remember what happened on that day. We reflect what happened on that day. What do we do with that? Every time we look at the story of Jesus in the cross, it can bring all kinds of emotions to us. It can bring joy, peace, love, regret for our sin, conviction, and more emotions. What do we do with those emotions? Do we just fill them and move on? Or do they lead us to do something? And there are two things that come to mind. First, we remember that we're called to a new way of living. Romans 6, 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We remember we're called to a new way of living, and this new life we live is one that dies to sin. A new life where we see how disgusting sin actually is, how condemning sin actually is. We no longer compare ourselves to others who sin, but we see that sin in light of the cross and who Jesus is. We remember that that sinful thought that we're contemplating on, that is why Jesus died on the cross. It does not mean that we will never sin again, but we no longer habitually give in to it over and over and over without fighting it anymore. Where we give in to sin so much where we become calloused to that certain sin, meaning we no longer feel bad about it. We no longer even care what God thinks about that sin. So instead, we take up our cross, our own desires, our own wants, just as Jesus did. Jesus had his own desires as a human as well. So what were Jesus' desires? And we see one of them in the garden on the night before he was crucified. We see him praying to his father. And Jesus didn't sit there and say, man, I cannot wait to be crucified tomorrow. Instead, All night long, for hours and hours, Jesus prayed in agony, in sweat, in tears. God, if this this cup can pass me, please allow it to. But, Father, your will be done. So our own desires, our own wants, how we would define what a good life looks like, what pleasure looks like, we see that and we're willing to give it up. Why? Because there's four reasons that come to mind. First, because God has something greater for you. Second, because just as Jesus showed, God's glory is greater than our pain. Third, so we can be able to be used by God. And fourth, because our desires are often fake. Our desires can often deceive us. They can often give us empty promises and false hope that turn into sorrow or depression or worse. Anything that is temporary is nothing compared to what is eternal. The world is no one's home, and it is not reality. Our wants and desires provide temporary happiness that can be taken away in an instance. Reality is the gospel. Reality means that we are no longer short-sighted by temporal things anymore. Reality is saying that my own eternity means more to me. Reality is saying that I am willing to sacrifice because Jesus means more to me than my sin or these temporal things that give false hope. We look at the cross and we remember that we are called to a new way of living, a more hopeful way, a more joyful way, a more real way where we are no longer slaves to our sin. And second, we remember that we're called to a new way of thinking. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Romans 12, 1, which is the verse right before that, talks about this new way of living. And then verse 2, which we just read, talks about this new way of thinking. So how is our mind to be renewed? And our mind is renewed by the gospel The most incredible story in history is not something we need to be reminded of at church. It needs to be a lens by which we see the rest of the world. It needs to be the lens by by the way which we see others and how we see ourselves. When you parent, how often does the gospel impact what you do? When you talk to your family members and friends, how often does the gospel impact what you say? When you go to work, how often does the gospel impact how you perform? When you do mundane tasks that you feel 
do not matter in the least. We remember that it is not about the task that we're doing. We remember in Philippians that it says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. When you see others, do you define them as that person who annoys you or that person who often disagrees with you or someone to prove wrong or that person you vent about? Is that how you define them? May we see others as souls who will spend eternity in one of two places. And may that impact us to where it changes what we do and how we do it. When you're having a conversation with someone, what's the purpose? What's the goal of your conversation? What is the purpose of the words that are coming out of your mouth? And may it be in hopes that you can tell the story of Jesus. And may it be in hopes that you can show love in some way. May this week, may this weekend as well, not be a time of just remembrance for us, but may it also be a time of development and transformation for us. So we end by asking again, why is this Good Friday? Because on Sunday, Jesus will rise again, and Easter is coming. Let's pray. God, we come to you right now, and we look at... We look at the most incredible story in history, God. We look at what your son did for us on the cross. We look at his sacrifice. We look at what happened, and we remember and we reflect on this day. We understand that, there, that he paid the debt that we don't have to, God. And God, I pray that that would impact us on a personal level. I pray that that would impact us in how we speak, in what we say, in who we who we talk to, and how we see others, God, and how we see you, Lord. I pray that we would see sin for what it is, God. Lord, for those of us who are stuck in a sin that we just keep justifying, Lord, I pray that you would help us stop doing that, God. I pray that we would give that to you and and let it go, God. I pray that we would see that sin for what it is and see that sin as we also see your nails and feet being nailed on that cross. And God, as we, as we remember, Lord, I pray that it, that would impact us in our households and where we work and everywhere we go, Lord. Amen.